Our lesson tonight comes from Psalm 62, looking at the importance of having an unshakable faith and unshakable trust in God. Throughout the Psalms, you find numerous Psalms and numerous verses encouraging us to trust and put our complete faith in God. And Psalm 62 does exactly the same thing. Think about these questions. What should man's rock be? Who can man trust? And where can man put his trust? In Psalm 62, David shows us that he knows where he should put his trust, and so should we. We begin by looking at Psalm 62, looking at, at the idea of God is salvation. In Psalm 62, looking at verse 1, we find how David refers to God as his salvation. He says, Truly my soul sil silently waits for God. From Him comes my salvation. Now salvation means to be saved or to be rescued. I often think about you know, some of those lifeboats and things that have the, the ring they would throw out into the water to, for someone to grab hold on, and they would grab hold or put it around them, and then they would pull them in. Well, their whole purpose is to save or rescue that person. In fact, there was an entire movie that dealt with the Coast Guard and rescuing people at sea and showed them coming in a helicopter and people dropping down or diving down to the water to pull someone out and put them in a cage and lift them up. They were going to save them and be their salvation, their rescuer in that situation. And God is the one who saves us. He's the one who rescues us from our situation of, and our problem of sin. Only God can provide such salvation. Man at times may help us physically from various uh, problems and, and things such as that. Maybe, you know, like you think of an ambulance and a car wreck or an ambulance coming in someone's home or various ways in which mankind physically saves other human beings. But mankind cannot spiritually save anyone. Only God can do that. We find here in verse 1, he says, Truly my soul silently waits for God. And you think about someone who silently waits for someone. The idea really is, is showing great perseverance and patience and determination to wait for what is coming. And he says his soul waits for God. It doesn't wait for man. It waits for God. From him, he says, comes my salvation, comes his rescuing. And so he waits patiently, silently, he says there in verse 1, for God. And so God is his salvation. It is God who rescues him. It is God who redeems him and pulls him out. As David talks about sometimes, he pulls me out of many waters, or he pulls me out or lifts me out from deep waters. We find also in the next verse that God, he points out, is worthy of trust. He says in verse 2, he says in verse 2 here, he, he only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be greatly moved. Now you notice there he says that he only is my rock and salvation. Only God can be trusted with our salvation. Now you think about that for a moment. We know mankind has a lot of ideas about salvation. But they have a lot of ideas. Mankind has a lot of ideas for plans for man's salvation. We have seen a lot of little tracks unfold neatly to a cross that don't lead you near the cross at all. We have the traditions of mankind that lead us actually further away from God. And so only God can be trusted with our salvation. And then he goes on to say how he is my defense. I shall not be greatly moved. God is his rock, whereas man is so many times the shifting sand that cannot stay still. You know, I've never seen a house built upon the sand. Even out on a beach somewhere, they dig down deep and they put in a foundation of some type, whether it be on, on giant pillars or just digging down far enough to build up that foundation because you don't build anything upon sand because it moves. The last thing you want is a foundation 
that shifts. You look at a house, you go and look at houses, and if you find a crack in the foundation, you know that, that foundation has shifted and it affects the entire house. Spiritually speaking, it's the same thing. If we build, build our souls, uh, the foundation for our souls upon a foundation that shifts and moves, it affects everything above it. And he says here, His de he is my defense. I shall not greatly, I shall not be greatly moved. It's not the idea that God will allow us to be moved here or there, but sometimes mankind wavers, but God does not. God's still there. It's man that so many times moves. He says, God is his rock, unlike man who is so many times like the shifting sand we see around us. We find next the need. The need, and that is enemies cause us to need to trust in someone. Our enemies, you might say, remind us that we need someone we can trust and someone who we can rely upon. Think about this. How long will enemies harass us? David asked the question, how long will enemies harass him? But how long will our enemies harass us? Well, look there in Psalm 62 and verse 3. He tells us in Psalm 62 and verse 3, For you have been a shelter for me. We break this down in two sections. He says here, You have been a shelter for me in verse... I'm sorry, that's the wrong, wrong one. How long will you attack a man? In Psalm 62 verse 3, How long will you attack a man? This being a question that's aimed really at his enemies. How long will they attack me? How long will they keep harassing me? Well, we know that could be until... Christ returns in all reality. But we also know that all of them will be punished. All those who harass him, all those who have been against him, God will deal with them. Look also next at the, at the second part of this verse. We find here this idea. He says, You shall be slain, all of you, like a leaning wall and like a tottering fence. Is it like a leaning fence? Sooner or later they will fall. I think about some of the fences around the homes of some in our subdivision. And uh, sometimes you look at the right angle, you see how half of them are kind of leaning like this, especially after a storm. Well, a lot of them have been replaced recently because of storms. You see them put up and they're reinforced and those types of things. But the old ones, they're leaning and they're tottering. And sometimes if you're in the right place during a storm, you can see some of them actually kind of move a little bit because they're temporary things. They're not going to stay there forever. They're not made of steel. They're made of wood. And so they're going to move over time and they're going to wear out and totter and eventually have to be replaced. He says, You shall be slain, all of you, like a leaning wall and a tottering fence. They're going to fall eventually. And no doubt those who harass and abuse the faithful, they will receive their just repayment, their just reward from God. All of you, says, like a leaning wall, like a tottering fence, sooner or later God will deal with them. Notice in verse 4, we might say the goal of his enemies. What is their main goal? What are they trying to do to David? And, and today, what do people of, who are enemies of the cross or enemies of Christianity, enemies of God, what is their ultimate goal? To drive you away from God and probably cause you to become unfaithful. Then they'll think, well, see, we've, we've reached that person. Well, look at verse 4 of Psalm 62. They only consult to cast him down from his high position. They delight in lies, they bless with their mouth, but they curse him, but they curse inwardly. <clears throat> their goal was to bring down the righteous, was to cause the righteous, that is, followers of God, to falter and sin against him. Their goal was to harass, to hinder, and to mock. He says, they delight in lies. They bless with their mouth, but, in, but they curse inwardly. Those of the world sometimes are not always so blunt as to say something against you face to face, but when you walk away, they'll murmur about you. Well, that's that we find here in verse 4. But they curse inwardly. Their goal is to harass, to hinder, and to mock. We find next the solution. The solution to all this is I will trust in God and so should you. That's David's thrust. I will trust in God and so should you. David reminds himself in verse 5 to trust in God. As we find similar words as we saw earlier in verse 1, my soul waits, my soul waits silently for God alone for my expectation 
is from Him. It's a reminder saying, I'm going to do this. I'm going to wait upon God. You know, sometimes we have to remind ourselves, these people are not Christians. Of course they're going to say these things. These people do not love God. Of course they're going to say these things. Of course they're going to act this way. Well, David reminds himself here in verse 5, or so it would seem as a reminder to himself, My soul wait silently for God alone, for my expectation is from Him. He doesn't say his expectation or his hope is from God or from man, but from God instead. It's from Him, capitalized, meaning it is from God. David next, we find, proclaims his trust in God in verses 6 and 7 of Psalm 62. He proclaims his trust in God. And he says, He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be moved. A lot like verses 1 and 2 earlier. And God is my salvation and my glory. The rock of my strength and my refuge is in God. When you repeat something over and over again, the, you do so for emphasis. My trust, my hope, my refuge, my strength, my salvation. He says all those things is in God. Man falters, God never does. Man has shortcomings, God has none. David proclaims his trust is in God. He is his rock, his salvation, his defense. Again in verse 7, his salvation, his glory. Again his rock in verse 7. Again his strength in verse 7. Again his refuge in verse 7. And it's all pointing towards God. In verse 8, David recommends others to trust in God, to pour out their hearts to Him. He says, trust in Him at all times, you people. He's talking to those who are perhaps are not, who are not followers of God. He's telling them to trust in Him at all times, you people. Pour out your heart before Him. God is a refuge for us. He's encouraging them to stop their wickedness and to turn to God. Pour out your heart before Him. You know, sometimes our denominational friends like to use this idea of pouring out your heart to God, and it's a very emotional type of thing. But you put it in context, the idea, the idea is to pour out what? It seems to me to pour out and repent before God. To, let, to confess your trespasses before God and to put your supreme trust in Him. Pour out your heart before Him. God is a refuge for us. For who? For human beings. We can put our hope and our trust in Him. He says, trust in Him at all times, you people. Pour out your heart before Him. The warning we find next in verses 9 and 10 the warning, the way of sin is not trustworthy. The way of sin is not trustworthy. Man is nothing in comparison to God. When we compare man and compare the things that man tries to use to better himself and to gain prosperity, those types of things, they come to nothing, especially in comparison to God. In verse 9 it says, Surely men of low degree are a vapor. Men of high degree or a lie. If they are weighed on the scales, they are altogether lighter than vapor. What an interesting way to put that. Surely men of low degree are a vapor. What does that mean? Men of low degree are those who are what? We might say those who are scoundrels. But then he says men of high degree are a, are a lie. Now, you think about this. Could he also be referring to those who think they are men of high degree? Because in my mind, when we talk about these spiritual things, men of high degree are those who are followers of God. Men of low degree are those who have chosen not to follow in God. But here we find he refers to this as those who are, you might say, scoundrel, and those who might say who are in positions of, of power. But both, he says here, are what? They're faulty. One is a vapor, the other is a lie. He says if they are weighed on the scales, they are all together lighter than vapor means what they have nothing to which you can find true weight in they're not something that's going to actually help you they're not there to actually build you up many times oftentimes man cannot be trusted man you know you think about it, if you cannot weigh them on a scale 
they're not any good to you, are they? But we, we can weigh God on a scale. We're talking about in, in, the, in, the, in the scheme of how he helps us today. Well, he is our salvation, as David says. He is our rock. He is our refuge. He is our uh, hope. All those things, which man many times cannot be. We also notice the, the vanity of trusting man's wicked ways. The vanity of trusting man's wicked ways. Now, vanity is something that is useless. That means we find no use in trusting the wicked ways of man. We see in verse 10 that simple ways of prosperity are not pleasing to God. Look at the first part of verse 10. Do not trust in oppression nor vainly hope in robbery. Now, there are those who gain prosperity today by oppressing others and by being flat out really thieves. You know, we talk to some people today, and they talk about someone who's a shrewd businessman. That means they're, they're tough. Maybe they're not even fair all the time. And that seems to be the idea here. They, are, they do not trust in oppression, meaning they, do, meaning they do oppress, nor vainly hope in robbery. That is what? Taking advantage of others and being unfair and taking that which is not yours. He says also in verse 10, to not trust in sinful gains. Look at the latter part of verse 10. If riches increase, do not set your heart on them. Now we just saw a moment ago, they oppress, they rob. He says, if your riches increase, don't set your heart on them. Don't set your trust on riches, even though you're doing well. Do wicked people sometimes prosper? Well, all the time. But that doesn't mean we should trust in how they do things. Because on a day of judgment, those who prosper doing wicked things, just because they're prosperous doesn't mean God is pleased with them. Do not trust in sinful gains. Next, we have his conclusion. To keep hearing his, that is God's message, and to rely on him. We find that God's message hasn't changed. We look at the first part of verse 11 here. We find where he says, God has spoken once. That is, the message that is given to one is also given to another, as we'll see in a moment. He said he's not, he hasn't just heard it once, he's heard it twice. It's the same message. You know, if we hear a gospel lesson, and it's explained in one way, and it's a scriptural way, shouldn't it sound the same way when someone else gets up and teaches the same thing? It may not be word for word the same thing, but the idea and the teaching should be exactly the same. Someone gets up and talks about repentance and baptism. Someone else gets up the same verses. Do you think those things shouldn't come up again as well? Repentance and baptism? You think, well, obviously so. The message that is given to one is also given to another. God has spoken once, he says there in verse 11. Then he goes on to say in verse 11, that he says, but by twice I have heard this, as he says here, twice I've heard this, that power belongs to God. He's saying, I've heard it once, I've heard it twice, it's the same thing. By twice I've heard this shows that man must be willing to continue to listen to God. He didn't stop just because, oh, oh, I've heard it before. I had a preacher friend of mine talk about where he, a place he used to labor, it's not there anymore. And he said, well, you know, we had a gospel meeting and I mean, we were talking about how, great it, how good it was, and, and then one man says, well, I didn't hear anything I haven't heard before. So what? Right? Doesn't Paul tell us we need to, the Apostle Paul tells us we need to be reminded about things? Because we can forget. Because we haven't, we've heard it before doesn't mean we've actually, we have actually applied it, right? He says, twice have heard this, that power belongs to God. That message comes from God, he says there in verse 11. And next we find, as we look at this conclusion about hearing God's message and continuing to hear God's message that has not changed, we find a reminder in verse 12, a reminder of repayment. We know that God is merciful and just. Look at verse 12. Also to you, O Lord, belongs mercy, for you render to each one according to his work. That means God makes judgment upon us based on what we have done in this life. You know, we find that same idea throughout the Bible. While we're Adam and Eve kicked out of the garden because God saw their work and saw they were doing something that was wrong and simple, went against His command, they were kicked out. We look at Solomon and Gomorrah. Why did God punish them? He saw what they were doing. 
They were what? They were judged. We move to the New Testament, we find the same thing over and over again. And we find warnings about the coming ultimate judgment of Christ, where he tells us that he will judge each one according to what? To what they have done, whether good or bad. Ecclesiastes tells us that same thing. It will judge er everyone based on everything they have done, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. Also to you, O Lord, belongs mercy. Just because God can bring repayment doesn't mean He's not merciful. He's merciful to those who repent, isn't He? O Lord, belongs mercy for you render to each one according to His work. Doesn't mean everyone's going to what? Reap uh, torments. Those who, have been, those who have repented and made themselves right before God, what are they going to receive based upon their work? Eternal life. And those who haven't, something else. Something far worse. So God is merciful and just and God will, will repay those who work wickedness, but He will also reward those who have worked righteousness. What are some lessons for us today concerning Psalm 62? I think what the first thing we need to consider is that we should never forget where our trust should be. Where our trust should be. You know, we, there's a lot of things on the news that worry us, that stress us out, we're not careful. And maybe some of the things that's going on worry us, but where our trust is should never falter. We find in verses 1 and 2, it says, Truly my soul waits for God. For him, from Him comes my salvation. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be greatly moved. And then in verses 6 and 7, we find the same type of idea. He only is my rock and my salvation. There he goes again. He is my defense. I shall not be moved. And in, in God is my salvation and my glory. The rock of my strength and my refuge is in God. He knows where his trust is. Was he facing hardship? Absolutely. But so do we still today. But our trust should still be in the same place that David's was, and that's in God. And we also can learn that we should encourage others to put their trust in God. In verse 8, he says, Trust in Him at all times, you people. Pour out your heart before Him. God is a refuge for us. We should encourage others to look to God. Not just the non-Christian, encouraging them to come and put on Christ, but also the Christian sometimes. We get consumed with worry and, and stress, and we need reminded that we need to put our trust in God. With so many in opposition to Christians today, we must have complete trust in God. We must remember that He is the one who can save us in difficult times. He's the one who can lift us out of those muddy waters and out of the mire that David also mentioned so many times in the Psalms. How many times must man be let down before he places his trust in God? You think about that. How many times has man let us down and we still trust in man to do things before we pray to God about it? You know, sometimes we don't realize it, that when bad things happen, our first reaction says a lot about us, doesn't it? When bad things happen, do we stop and pray? Do we freak out and call someone else and ask them what do we need to do? Or do we stop and pray? Or do we call someone and ask them you know, to come help us? Or do we stop and pray? Because so many times, stopping and praying when things are going badly or when things are going good isn't what happens. Something happens in our life and we are so very grateful for it. We're thankful we couldn't believe it happened, but yet we don't stop and pray and tell God, thank you. Bad things happen, we don't stop and tell God, what do we do? Our first reaction says a lot about us. David's first reaction in verse 1 is repeated also in verses 6 and 7. He will trust in God. So we can learn a lot from his example when it comes to trusting in God. He had an unshakable faith. He did not have a perfect one, as we know he was not a perfect man. But he was not one who was easily shaken away from God. And neither should we. This evening, as you think about these things, we can help you or encourage you in any way. And come forward now. Let's go. We stand and sing the song that's been selected.